Uh, hello everyone, my name is Charlie and I'm the chair of the Imperial College Computational Biology Society and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to our talk today by Dr. Apatar Velichkovic of uh, Google DeepMind. Uh, after obtaining his A in Computer Science from the University of Cambridge, Patar stayed for a PhD in Computer Science under the supervision of Professor Pietro Leo with a focus on machine learning on non-trivially structured data and bioinformatics. During his PhD, he was the first author of the paper titled Graph Retention Networks, which introduced a now ubiquitous convolutional layer for GNNs and went on to receive over 3,000 citations. He is a highly active communicator in many areas of graph representation learning, organizing numerous conferences and workshops, and serves on the advisory board for the Serbian AI Society. Uh, Patar joined DeepMind in 2019, where he now serves as a senior research scientist and continues to use graph representation learning to solve real world problems. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to hand over to you, Patar. All right, thank you very much, uh, Charlie, for the very fine introduction. Uh, maybe I should uh, make a note of that and change my bio. That was actually very nice. Um, and thank you all for showing up for my talk today. Uh, it's great to see so many people, and uh, I hope that uh, you will find my story uh, interesting and uh, potentially connecting a, a few dots. So um, today I'll be talking to you about graph neural networks in computational biology, which uh, unsurprisingly is uh, about graph neural networks for biological data. Now this is a very broad uh, umbrella topic which can encompass a lot of different things. So, and, and as, as might be potentially expected, you would have seen the invite to this event and you might have come with a certain uh, forethought about what exactly would I be talking about. So let me start by very explicitly delimiting what I won't be talking about. So, Unfortunately, if you came to this talk today to hear about AlphaFold, uh, I am sorry to disappoint you. Uh, while protein folding is very much a, an exciting application area of uh, representation learning in uh, computational biology and uh, certainly a big result from DeepMind's side, uh, I wasn't personally involved in this project to the extent where I can actually really talk about it. But if you do want to find out more about the solution, we do have uh, a fairly uh, well detailed blog post that talks about some aspects of our solution while we wait for a paper to be presented. So just sort of making that very clear at the onset, we will not be talking about AlphaFold, but hopefully um, there's still a lot of very exciting parts of computational biology that can be amenable to representation learning and especially graph representation learning. And I was quite uh, fortunate over the years to participate in many projects at the intersection of these two fields, and they hit so many interesting uh, aspects other than just protein folding. So uh, I will be talking to you about things like molecular interactions, protein function prediction, genome assembly, computational neuroscience and electronic health records, provided that we'll have enough time to cover all of these things. So hopefully enough interesting material to keep you occupied for the duration of this talk. By the way, uh, please, whenever you have questions, just uh, write them in the chat box and we will take them at the end of this talk. Um, so uh, I seem to be having a slight delay with uh, my slides loading. Uh, one second. All right, yeah, so more broadly speaking, this talk is a my own personal perspective on this very rich and interdisciplinary field. And also it kind of tries to deliver a separate message for a machine learning audience and for the biology audience, because I believe we have representatives from both attending the talk today. So for people who are interested in machine learning or who might even have some experience in machine learning and are potentially curious about could they apply some of their techniques to solve challenging biological problems? I think the takeaway message should be you can do it and hopefully I'll give you a nice blueprint for how to best approach the area with some interesting uh, things that have already been done. And for the biological people in the audience, hopefully I'll present to you these graph neural networks as a useful computational tool that in principle could be useful across the board in biological problems. And maybe a great message for both is that uh, sometimes the most interesting interdisciplinary projects happen when the machine learning people and computational biology people get together and tackle these challenges together. Some of these uh, collaborations can really work wonders. So as I said, it's a bit of a personal perspective and I want to sort of tell you 
uh, a bit about how uh, I came where I am uh, uh, right now and how my interest in biology was initially fueled and how I have eventually managed to pair it up with my uh, interest in machine learning. So I was born in Belgrade, which is today part of Serbia in the 1990s. And uh, I've had the fortune or misfortune that I had family members working for a local representative of a, of a big pharma company, Merck in particular. So I basically grew up with uh, periodic tables plastered all over the wall and uh, various kinds of promotional material relating to chemistry or biology. So I was basically exposed to some of these things from a very early age and I did find them interesting for better or worse. And gradually as I started to um, get more and more involved in uh, uh, my schooling, I actually took a much greater interest in computer science, primarily uh, uh, classical algorithms, which was the main inlet to computer science at the time for uh, people who came from my country. Here's a photo of me. Uh, I think at the time I was uh, eight years old or so, and uh, on my very first computer trying to hack up some interesting visual basic scripts, I'm sure. And uh, afterwards, when I came to high school, I basically completely oriented myself towards maths, computer science, and so on. And uh, that doesn't mean I've stopped the interest in biology and chemistry. I was very fortunate to have uh, a very dedicated biology teacher, Branka, who uh, just with her teaching style really inspired me to look into biological problems and see them as something that's interesting. And it came to the point where when the time came to apply for my undergrad at Cambridge, Branka even wrote my uh, recommendation letter. And here is just an excerpt from her recommendation letter where she basically sort of highlighted what's going to happen in the future. I, I will very likely do at least some work at the intersection of bioinformatics and uh, computational biology and computer science. So uh, after that uh, successful stint, I started my computer science degree at Cambridge and uh, as a result, lost nearly all contact with biological problems. So for a very long time, I kind of harnessed my interest in computer science, but uh, there was basically no context in which uh, I was looking at biological problems at all. And uh, this changed in 2015 when I had to do a final year project at my university and I reached out to Professor Pietro Leo, who uh, was uh, specializing at the intersection of computational biology, machine learning and algorithmic techniques. And uh, my initial foray into bioinformatics was inspired by the fact that I was still very much interested in theoretical computer science and bioinformatics seems to be the applied area of computer science where the classical algorithms crop up all the time, like string alignments and uh, DNA sequencing and so on. And uh, while I started with an algorithmic uh, inspiration, Pietro suggested I should maybe focus on this uh, quite emerging recent area of machine learning. And uh, me deciding to take him up on that advice is uh, what led to everything that led to this talk. So the main takeaway from here is that while I do have quite a bit of like historical vested interests in biology, I really don't have any formal biological training. Most of my actual training and things that I specialized in are computer science and machine learning. And uh, then uh, prior to discovering graph neural networks, I started my PhD in 2016 and uh, my first work concerned classifying breast cancer. If you're really uh, persistent, you might be able to find that paper lying around somewhere. I would highly recommend not to read it. It's not really that good. Um, and officially, I started my PhD with a job title of research assistant in computational biology, but there was no real training in biology. So I started off with my machine learning knowledge and just kind of felt uh, lost in this whole space of biological challenges. And I was also surrounded with people who were mostly like biology or physics experts. So I, I felt like I was always the person in the room who didn't understand the fundamental things. But luckily, as I learned over the years, the field is actually remarkably accessible and there's a lot of interesting problems to solve. And what was very helpful for me is to find the right domain experts to talk to and just listen to what kinds of problems they're solving and what kinds of burning questions would they like to solve. And very often you will realize that the previous say, state of the art approach that bioinformaticians are using in an area uh, relates to typically somewhat of a shallow machine learning method like you know random forests or something like that with interesting featurizations. And usually one could make some headway at least by finding interesting ways to incorporate more deeper representation learning techniques into that. 
And that's what led to maybe my first two uh, kind of wider papers in the area, Parapred and Chronomid, that were published in Bioinformatics and PLOS One. In both cases, this was a careful discussion uh, with uh, machine learning people on one side and computational biology domain experts on the other side that carefully explained to us what the data was, what's currently being done, what are places where we can make an impact. And once we understood these things, the machine learning application actually wasn't that much of a challenging thing to set up. But the real game changing moment, these were just basically like isolated, uh, you know, isolated forays that did not necessarily have anything to bind them together. But for me, the game changing moment happened in 2017 when I started uh, discovering and uh, researching graph representation learning. And why do I think of it as game changing and why should you care about all of this? Well, I thought it would be good to start with a bit of an introduction to what graph representation learning is if you haven't come across it before and hopefully just immediately motivate you on why you might find it useful. So let's just dive right into it. Molecules are graphs. They can be very easily represented as a graph. You can look at different atoms in a molecule as nodes and different bonds connecting the atoms as edges. And you can put various featurizations on both the atoms and the bonds, such as what is the type of this atom? What's the atom's charge? On the bonds, you could say what's the type of the bond? Is it in a ring? And et cetera, et cetera. So one thing that's very interesting to do once you have a molecule in this representation is you'd like to predict whether or not this molecule will uh, inhibit a certain bacterium, like is it a potent drug? And you could build a binary classification data set where you have a bunch of molecules and you know, for example, whether they have a, a strong uh, response against uh, Escherichia coli. And you could train a curated data set of, of the, from this compounds, a graph neural network that basically takes this molecular graph representation and predicts a single uh, binary value like zero or one. Does it inhibit, does it not? And uh, what's really nice about this is that once you've trained the graph neural network like this to predict a response to E. coli, you can apply it to any molecule, not just the ones that you had in your data set for which you know the response. So what you can do is you can take a large data set of known candidate drug molecules, pick the top 100 candidates that your graph neural network model gives you because the way in which these regression problems are usually set up is the graph net will give you a probability that the molecule will inhibit E. coli. So you can take the top 100 probabilities that your model has and then send them to chemists for further analysis, maybe some additional filtering. And it just might happen that in these 100 or so candidates, you'll discover a compound that was previously completely overlooked by antibiotics research, but turns out to be a highly potent antibiotic in itself. This compound uh, I've given you here, it's called Halicin. It was initially uh, indicated for diabetics uh, therapeutics and uh, wasn't really studied in the concepts uh, of antibiotics at all. But subsequent experimentation showed that this uh, uh, compound not only is a potent antibiotic, but because of its fairly unusual structure for an antibiotic, it might be more potent against uh, bacteria that have developed resistance to the more uh, commonplace antibiotics. And obviously, once you have a, a great approach like this, you uh, go ahead and publish it in a journal, which is what uh, these many authors from MIT have done. And what actually happens is this publication very quickly get picked up by uh, Nature, by Financial Times, by the BBC, and so on. This actually happened in February 2020, very shortly before the COVID pandemic hit. And uh, if you've ever, like, if you remember those times, there were a lot of headlines saying how scientists have discovered powerful antibiotics using AI. Well, now you can actually know that it was actually a graph neural network powering the screening process that uh, was used to discover this antibiotic, which is what most of these uh, news outlets would uh, not really report on. So hopefully this very simple example that I wasn't involved in, but is arguably one of the most popularized uh, applications of graph representation learning, shows you why it might be a good idea to consider graph neural networks as part of your computational toolbox. Um, and outside of computational biology, graph neural networks are just a super hot research topic right now. There's a lot of active development. And uh, if you look at the keywords on the top submissions for every conference uh, in machine learning, graph neural networks regularly rank among the top concepts, second only maybe to reinforcement learning. And back when we still had physical conferences, we organized a lot of workshops on graph representation learning. And um, 
uh, for example, at NeurIPS 2019, we organized one and we had uh, 1,300 people signed up to attend, which made us at that time the second largest workshop after uh, deep reinforcement learning. So in many ways, you can think of graph neural networks as currently experiencing their ImageNet moment of like very rapid development, very rapidly discovering new applications, and biology is just one of many such applications. And not just that, it's getting more and more easy to get started because unlike at the times of the ImageNet revolution, when there wasn't really a huge wealth of choice for what you would use to build your convolutional neural nets, nowadays for graph neural networks, you have a wealth of libraries to use regardless of which framework you use. So for PyTorch, you have PyTorch Geometric and DGL. For TensorFlow, you have Spectral and DeepMind's graph nets. And for JAX, we recently released the Giraffe library at DeepMind that you might find useful. So there's definitely a lot of resources to just quickly get started with writing your own graph neural networks. And also there's a lot of data sets. Uh, surprisingly, you cannot have you know, good machine learning models without great data. And uh, we are happy to have a lot of concentrated efforts for building good data sets. Uh, the OGB and TU data sets are two uh, groups of data sets that uh, especially hunt to gather like uh, relevant data sets from the real world and this very often involves uh, uh, problems of interest to biology such as protein protein interactions or small molecule predictions or mutagenicity prediction and so on but also the benchmarking graph neural nets paper is a another great example of uh, a sample of data sets for um, just generally prototyping properties of graph neural networks okay so hopefully this gives you a bit of a motivation for why processing data that lives on a graph is something that will be useful to you. But I still have yet to tell you anything about how to actually process the data that lives on that graph. And uh, the way in which we normally do that is we have a graph with some nodes and input features in the nodes. These are the X vectors. And my graph neural network layer in principle should look at a particular node and perhaps look at all the nodes which are in its immediate neighborhood. And based on that set of neighbors, predict the next uh, features for that particular node. And then you can just iterate this layer with uh, different parameters, maybe your favorite activation function, and you'll eventually get to uh, you know, uh, features that you can use to predict uh, any outputs that you care about. So at the heart of everything is this function G, which takes a nodes feature and the, all the features in its immediate neighborhood and uh, decides what the resulting uh, feature should be for that node. And then you can apply that function to every nodes neighborhood in isolation. Um, okay, so uh, the way in which we will construct these useful functions over graphs, as I said, is by a shared application of a local permutation invariant function. And if you've looked at any graph neural network literature, you might have seen this uh, function G referred to as either diffusion, propagation, or message passing. And what we'll do here is actually take a quick look at ways in which you can actually concretely define what this G function is. I should highlight it's a super intense area of research. Every day there's at least 10 to 20 papers proposed trying to define a different message passing layer. But what's very fortunate for us is that almost everything that gets proposed out there can be classified as belonging to one of three spatial flavors. And uh, this is a quick overview of the three flavors, which we dub convolutional, attentional, and message passing. We will dive into each one of those uh, separately, but this is just like a one slide overview of the three types and the uh, corresponding message passing rules for those three. Okay, so the first one, the arguably the simplest one to build and the most scalable one, but also least uh, representationally powerful is the convolutional graph neural network, where you upfront decide uh, what the importance of every neighbor is to the node that's receiving that neighbor's features, and you call this a constant CIJ. So CIJ means that uh, neighbor J's features are important for node I uh, relative to this constant. So what you can then do is basically learn a weighted sum or a weighted combination of your neighbors. So you first transform each neighbor's features with some pointwise function psi, like a simple uh, pointwise neural network layer. Then you multiply those with uh, a weighting constant that was pre-specified, and then you combine all those together with a function that's invariant to the uh, permutations. So specifically, one example of this function here could be a sum, but it can also be average, max, or something like that. 
Once you've aggregated all of your neighbors in this way, computing this weighted aggregation, you pass that weighted aggregation to another function phi, which gives you the final representation uh, of that particular node. And uh, since these Cs are fixed, uh, a very obvious question arises, where do they come from? And usually the weights of these Cs will depend directly on the adjacency matrix. So uh, leading to some proposals like Chebyshev networks, graph convolutional networks, which are currently the most popular uh, graph net paper out there, and the simplified graph convolutions, which showed uh, just how strong of a model you can build with uh, concepts like these. And obviously, because it has all these pre-specified coefficients uh, that are just computing weighted sums over neighbors, you can realize it as uh, very efficient sparse matrix multiply operations, which means that uh, this kind of GNN is e easiest to scale up, and it's also quite useful for graphs that are homophilous. So uh, what this means is that if I have an edge between two nodes, it is very, very likely that these two nodes will share the same prediction. And that means that if I just take the average of all of my neighbors, I am pretty much on a good position to make any downstream predictions. So whenever my edges encode for labels being similar and uh, I'm concerned about scaling up, the convolutional GNN is usually the way to go. Um, moving on from there, uh, I'm just, yeah, the attentional graph neural network uh, tries to maybe break away a little bit from this uh, homophily assumption, but uh, doesn't sacrifice too much of the scale. So in this case, I'm still saying that my features are going to be some combination of my neighbors, but I'm not going to pre-specify the coefficient of interaction depending on my graph structure. Instead, I'm going to learn it. And the reason why I might want to do that is, for example, if we're on a social network like Twitter and I uh, retweet somebody else's post, I could be completely agreeing with them, but I could be thoroughly disagreeing with them. And as a result, uh, you may not want to classify me in the same class as the person whose post I've shared. You might actually want to dynamically learn how much influence should that particular neighbor have over me. And uh, what this uh, amounts to is just a slight modification of our previous rule where we had a fixed constant cij. We now have a function that takes the features of the sender and the features of the receiver node and computes a single scalar, which tells you the coefficient of interaction. And uh, if you've done any work on uh, architecture such as transformers, this will be familiar to you as the attention mechanism. So it's something that takes the features of the two nodes and predicts a scalar interaction coefficient. Uh, a few powerful instantiations of this uh, template in graph neural net land are the Monet model, uh, the graph attention net model, which I've uh, first proposed, and the gated attention net models. And it's a good middle ground with respect to capacity and scale. So now your edges no longer need to be encoding for homophily. You can actually learn the coefficient of interaction, but you still need to compute only a scalar in every edge, so you could still feasibly scale this up to a reasonable level. But for some kinds of problems, and computational chemistry is no exception to that, you might actually uh, not just find it enough to have a weighted average of your neighbors, but instead uh, the neighbors may interact with you in non-trivial ways and edges may just be a recipe for how to pass messages. And in this case, you actually cannot say that the features of the receiver are just a combination of the senders. You have to have some cooperation between the sender and the receiver to compute a message vector to go along that particular edge. So in this case, remember how previously we had a weighted combination of pointwise functions? Now we have a combination of uh, uh, functions that are applied to pairs of nodes at once. So from features of node i and features of node j, I compute a message vector that I aggregate and then based on that uh, compute the um, output features. This type of model was popularized by interaction networks, message passing neural nets where it was first applied to quantum chemistry and the graph nets model from DeepMind. And as far as these one hop uh, spatial me uh, message passing layers go, this is the most generic GNN layer you can have. The generality comes at a cost, of course. You may have some issues with scalability because now you have to store entire edge vectors and there's a lot more parameters compared to the previous model. So you might have to face some overfitting or other learnability issues. But because it's basically relying on the fact that edges are just a recipe for message passing. This makes it ideal when you expect your neighbors to interact in non-trivial ways. So things like reasoning, simulation, and indeed computational chemistry could be quite amenable to this type of neural network. So I've hopefully given you a nice bird's eye view of what kinds of GNNs we have. And I'll just very quickly mention once you have a GNN, how do you actually use it?
So imagine I have an input graph with some uh, node features Xi in each of my nodes and some adjacency matrix telling me the connectivity. Once I apply the graph neural network to it, as mentioned, it will look at every node's neighborhood and it will update the features from these input features X to some latent features H that came as a result of neighborhood aggregation. And once I have these as the output of my GNN, what can I do? If I want to classify things in my nodes, I just learn a node classifier that acts on every H vector in isolation. If I want to classify an entire graph, I can do that. I just need to compress the entire graph into one feature. And the way in which I do that is by combining all of my latent features into one vector with some permutation and variant aggregation. For example, taking the sum or taking the average of all the H's and then passing that through a graph level classifier. And finally, I might be interested in predicting the existence or properties of different links in the graph. And in this particular setting, I can learn uh, under certain cases, I can learn a classifier that looks at features of the sender, features of the receiver, any edge features I might have in between, and based on that, predict uh, whether or not uh, there should be a link or what are the properties of this particular link in the graph. Now, this was a very, very quick rundown to graph neural network foundations. If uh, you're starting out in this field and you want to get a better grip on the perspectives and principles, I would highly recommend checking out my recent talk on theoretical gene and foundations. It's basically a one hour version of what I've just given you with a lot more insights from computational chemistry and otherwise. But that's not the topic of our discussion today. And uh, just before we dive into the different applications, I'm going to present them to you in a sort of chronological way that corresponded to how my opinions about applying these things in biology shifted through time. So in 2017, I did an internship uh, at Mila in Montreal, and we proposed the graph attention networks as a result. And these graph attention networks have since then become one of the first prominent examples of attentional GNNs, and they still remain fairly popular. But to me at the time, it was very loosely clear that these models could help any of my biological projects. And uh, one thing that was very important at that time is that we immediately set out to find how much these graph neural networks can help in biology. So without further ado, the first paper we'll talk about is uh, perhaps incorrectly titled Convolutional Nets for Mesh-Based Parcellation of the Cerebral Cortex, when actually in reality what we looked at were GNNs and not CNNs. And uh, it was a fantastic collaboration with uh, various uh, machine learning experts, machine learning PhD students, and uh, excellent advisors, both on the machine learning side and the uh, computational neuroscience side. So a very like thoroughly interdisciplinary work with uh, both the data experts and the modeling experts all in one place. And uh, this was a paper we published at uh, middle in uh, 2018, the first conference in medical imaging for deep learning. Uh, okay, so uh, what we're looking at in this task is uh, we want to do the parcellation of the cerebral cortex and different areas of the cerebral cortex, which is a part of the human brain, are involved in different cognitive processes. So different parts of the brain may be involved in processing visual inputs or comprehending language. And uh, to map exactly which parts of the brain for every individual subject correspond to different uh, functions will help us gen just generally understand how the cortex is organized. And one thing that was quite new to me at the time is I didn't realize, because uh, in high school I've always been taught about there being regions of the brain that correspond to a particular function. I never really quite fathomed that for different people, the map, the exact mapping of different regions, the different functions may well be completely different. And in this project, we looked at a very variable part of the brain, regions 44 and 45 within Broca's area, which is quite uh, involved in language understanding. And um, one thing, the reason why we looked at only a tiny chunk of the brain is because at the time, only that data was completely labeled. So just, just before you ask, why didn't we look at uh, the other parts? And one thing that's very interesting is that we didn't start building graph attention networks with the interest of coming out with a GNN paper. We were actually just interested in finding better ways to process this brain mesh. So in a way, this project was what spiraled uh, graph attention networks as a, as a offspring. And uh, if you haven't seen or heard about cortical mesh segmentation before, what we mean is that we're basically partitioning the surface of the brain into these uh, triangulations. 
So this uh, 3D mesh gives us a common coordinate system of all the points in the brain. And at every point uh, in this mesh, we can represent various modalities and features, typically that would arise from an fMRI scan. And it can also be helpful for us to co-register different surfaces between different individuals. So once we have this, we can literally treat this triangulated mesh as a graph and run a graph neural network over the nodes in the mesh. And what we have to do, since we're doing the segmentation into these two regions, is classify every node as belonging to either functional region 44, functional region 45, or background. So not belonging to either one of those. So let's see what kind of results we get. Uh, of course, we looked at some very simple baselines. One very important part to think about whenever you're doing graph representation learning is check if your graph is even necessary. So first run a multi-layer perceptron in every node of your mesh and see how well is that at predicting uh, the different segmentations of the brain. And you can see it has a Jacquard coefficient of about 38.7, which is uh, fairly decent but uh, it's actually outperformed by even simpler baselines like just take the average representation over all nodes or take an MLP over all points in the mesh. But all of these were outperformed by a previous state of the art from uh, Jakobsen and others, which had a Jacquard coefficient of 52.4. Now let's see how the graph neural networks, GCN and GAT, fared against this uh, state of the art performance at the time. So we actually ended up seeing a significant boost from using a graph representation of the mesh and uh, applying these simple message passing steps. And uh, the GCN and the GAT had different regions that they segmented better. Their overall performance was actually on average roughly the same. And what we also found was quite interesting is we could boost the performance of the graph neural network even further if we just add an extra feature to every node of our mesh saying what's the X, Y, Z coordinate of this particular uh, part of the brain. And just adding that boosted our solutions up by a few uh, percentage points. And also qualitatively, you can see what happens. So here we have uh, two different uh, subjects and their ground truth segmentation into the regions 44 and 45 and the background in blue. And you can see how the different baselines fare at this problem. So the node MLP, as you can see, and also the previous state of the art from Jakobsen and others over segments, like it assumes that a lot of the background actually belongs in one of these two regions of interest. And the graph neural networks, uh, the GCN and the GAT, are actually able to, in a more controlled way, because of their using the mesh geometry, figure out where exactly these different uh, regions are and uh, as a result, achieve better results quantitatively and qualitatively. Um, and I want to just say a bit of hindsight because this project came out literally at the time when I was starting out in graph representation learning. Like we we found some utility by of using positional features like X, Y, Z, but you know most vanilla graph neural networks do not assume that their graph has any geometry attached to it, so would we'll discard that information and would we'll have to relearn it if it's necessary. So using a pure GNN is a bit wasteful here, when in fact meshes come with a lot of very useful geometry, which in principle should help you identify many interesting stuff about it, such as these human figures in the top right corner. And in today's day and age, we actually have a wealth of very interesting architectures that specialize just to run these neural networks on the mesh. So things like geodesic CNNs, the Monet, gauge equivariant mesh CNNs, they can all be seen as a sort of special case of graph neural networks, but uh, they're also highly tuned towards knowing that they're working on a mesh and uh, any of them would make a great choice for processing this brain mesh data. So if you're interested in a future project, uh, reach out to me. Maybe we can chat a little bit about uh, brain meshes and applying mesh CNNs on them. But let's get back to the past. So we had this fairly successful uh, GNNs on brain mesh project, which showed us that there is utility for GNNs in biological problems. Because when we built these uh, graph attention nets and we used the existing repository for GCNs, we pretty much just used these models out of the box. We didn't really do any specific tuning to get them to work in the biological domain. So there was a good faith that maybe these models can be quite helpful for us. So now was the time once I had a feel, OK, there is quite some potential here. Now was the time to see if we could look at some of the earlier work I've done on Pareto prediction without graph neural networks and see if we can improve it by using graph neural networks. And uh, this uh, was the foundation of our attentive cross-modal Pareto prediction paper, which uh, was uh, led by Andrea Deac and advised by Pietro Sormani from the Cambridge University's Department of Chemistry.
uh, and together we have built this uh, solution that further improved on the results of our paper that was initially published in bioinformatics. So uh, I hopefully don't need to motivate too much to this crowd. Why is it a good idea to design antibodies? But in case you've never seen antibodies and antigens before, they are these Y-shaped proteins that form a critical part of our immune system. And what they do is in a sort of lock and key system, they bind to parts of pathogenic bacteria or viruses. And then once they tag them, the immune system can destroy them. And if we were able to you know, design our own arbitrary antibodies for any antigen, that would be a really big step towards personalized medicine. These are, by the way, copied from a very old slide deck. Uh, over the past year, you've probably heard a whole lot about antibodies and antigens, even if you're not involved in this kind of research, simply because of all the COVID-related implications. So, but before, like, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Before you can think about generating an antibody, you should first understand what's going on with this binding in the first place. So what we set out to do in our paper is try to predict what are the specific parts of the um, uh, antibody. Uh, so in particular, this is called the paratope. Which of these amino acids actually participate in the neutralization of the antigen? So our input can be some sequence of one hot encoded antibodies residues or amino acids. I'll typically use residues and amino acids quite interchangeably here. And uh, potentially we might also have the antigen information in this form because the antigen itself might be a protein. And the output is then the probability for each of these amino acids to participate in the binding with the antigen. Now for the computational biologists in the audience, this should all seem like a fairly obvious setup, but uh, if you haven't ever visualized this before and you come from a more machine learning perspective, what does this mean? We look at the protein representation of the antibody. We look at its one dimensional sequence of amino acids. So at each step of the sequence, we have a, a character from a vocabulary of 20 or so amino acids. And then we learn a paratel predictor, which will for every position, for every amino acid in the sequence, predict the probability that that particular amino acid is binding to the antigen. And uh, our initial architecture, which is given at the top here, just applies kind of what was the state of the art in sequence processing at the time. So we just do a 1D convolution on the uh, antibodies amino acids and then do a bidirectional long short term memory, which is a simple recurrence neural network to get updated features in every um, uh, in every amino acid. And then finally, we just predict for every amino acid from its features whether or not it's binding. So the first thing we set out to do in uh, the project on cross-modal Pareto prediction was maybe to try to uh, plug different things that were perhaps seeing a bit more attention in uh, 2017 and onwards. So we first swapped this 1D convolution with a dilated convolution. These were very popular at the time due to the uh, success of wave nets. And uh, we replaced the bidirectional LSTM with a transform style attention, which was also uh, kind of a very popular uh, approach for sequence processing at the time. But otherwise, the architecture was pretty much exactly the same. So the only thing we changed is the way in which we derived the representation from the sequence. But in principle, the shapes of every one of these uh, outputs were still the same. And uh, one thing that was also quite exciting is that once we were able to incorporate this attention mechanism, that also allowed us a way to incorporate the antigen sequence more easily. So if we also have the antigen as a protein and we have a sequence of its amino acids, we can uh, then somehow use that sequence as part of our Pareto predictor and hopefully get a better prediction because the previous Parapred paper only looked at the antibody which meant that it had no context on what this antibody is supposed to bind to. But we, if we give it that context, presumably we might be able to get better results. Um, so if you look back to our setting from before, where uh, we just had the antibody residues attending over each other in a transformer style, so every antibody residue attends over every other, uh, we could pipe in antigen information basically by changing who attends over whom. So in the case of the antigen information being available, we can run the same dilated convolution to get the features of the antigen residues. And then rather than having the antibody attend over itself, we'll have the antibody attend over the antigen. So basically seek out parts of the antigen that it's most relevant to predicting whether it's binding. Um, 
And uh, the way in which we perform this attention is just using this attentional graph neural network signature that I showed you before. So there's an attention mechanism looking at the antibody features of the ith residue and the antigen features of the jth residue and use uh, the output of the attention mechanism as coefficients in a weighted sum of all the antigen residues. Then you can plug in your favorite activation function such as ReLU. And uh, if you look at it in this way, you can see this as basically another instance of graph attention networks, but over a fully connected graph between antibody and antigen residues. So this is actually a very standard assumption and what led to transformers, right? Like if you uh, have no upfront belief over what the edges of your graph should be, just assume everything is linked to everything and let the neural network figure it out by itself. And uh, What's very nice is that just by this simple application of uh, attentional mechanisms, we were able to substantially improve uh, on the previous results of Parapred. And as another sweet addition, because the uh, transformer mechanism is uh, parallelizable, uh, unlike the RNN, which has to like process one residue at a time in a sequential manner, we were able to uh, also substantially cut down uh, on the time required to perform one epoch of training, which might be useful if we're doing more larger scale protein prediction tasks. Um, besides that, we've been able to get some pretty nice visualizations of what the model is doing. So on the left hand side here, we visualize the heat map of different antibody residues and it's hotter if it's more likely by the model to be binding to the antigen. And you can see it predicts these like uh, hot regions as parts that are very close to the antigen without really ever being fed any geometric information, which is encouraging. And on the right hand side, we visualize the attention coefficients on the antigen for one particular antibody residue, which is in red. And you can see here it roughly learns to attach high heat parts of this attention to the parts of the antigen which are actually geometrically closest. Once again, we did not ever actually give it that exact geometrical information. It had to figure it out by itself by uh, gradient descent. So this is hopefully a good indicator that all these graph neural networks can also be helpful in the protein-protein interaction space. Now that it works for interactions between proteins, can we explore it in some other cases of molecular interaction? And this led us to a follow-up paper on drug-drug uh, interaction prediction, which was, uh, besides Andrea, also done in collaboration with Yushang and uh, Pietro and Gian. And uh, in this paper, we looked at uh, a very increasingly important problem of uh, the polypharmacy and increase in prescription drug use, where especially over the past decades, the amount of uh, prescription drug use is steadily increasing and perhaps even more shockingly, the proportion of the population that is taking more than five drugs at a time has dramatically increased. So what's happening really is that uh, um, you have these patients that are taking multiple medications concurrently, and this basically makes them kind of a self-isolated clinical study because it's very rare that in clinical trials you could actually try all of these different combinations of medicines uh, on, on, your, on your patients. So, and this is unfortunately a necessary thing to do for a chronic complex or multiple condition patients, and a lot of the cost increase for uh, drug use is from treating these cases. And, you know, while each one of these drugs in isolation might be doing a really good thing, uh, you could also look at this Hulk and Iron Man analogy where while drugs individually might be heroes, if you put them together, they can destroy everything around them. So here is one uh, sort of animation to illustrate that. You have uh, Hulk and Iron Man battling it out, trying to save the world, but uh, as a result of doing that, they might trash everything around them. So taking multiple drugs at once is not necessarily equivalent to taking their effects in isolation and adding them together. So one thing that you get as a result are adverse side effects and uh, they affect 15% of the population with uh, very large treatment costs every year. Some of them are found in phase four clinical trials so once the drug is put on the market, but plenty of them remain quite undiscovered for a long time until you end up with these polypharmacy scenarios. So it could be very useful to just identify what are these uh, 
poor side effects that we that we might want to catch so that you don't actually need to perform a clinical trial because uh, it's infeasible to try even all pairs of drugs at the same time given the quadratic complexity but you might be able to use results from existing studies to sort of infer what are the probable negatively interacting drugs before anybody ever tries to take these drugs at the same time so uh, a lot of the models in this space including the decagon paper that i linked here uh, predict uh, if a side effect exists or not using some notion of drug-drug similarity and uh, individual drug side effects or interaction profile fingerprints. And you can look at uh, pair interactions between pairs of drugs, pairs of proteins, and the uh, drug proteins, like which drugs are known to target which proteins, and then predict missing links between the different drugs. But here you're still treating the drug as a single node, whereas uh, as we discussed at the very beginning, molecules are graphs. And uh, to the best of our knowledge, we were among the first to actually try to not just consider a drug as a single node, but look at the drug's molecular graph as giving us a bunch of nodes. So what we're doing in this drug-drug interaction prediction task is we're looking at the molecular representation of two drugs and a particular side effect and we need to predict whether or not that particular side effect will occur. And the way in which we made this happen is, once again, kind of building off on the successes we had, uh, especially with graph attention mechanisms and message passing mechanisms uh, on individual molecules, we also took uh, on board this idea we had from the, um, from the Pareto prediction work, where we had every bit of the antibody interact with every bit of the antigen. Well, here it's similar every atom of drug X will feed information from all atoms of drug Y. So you have these like two message passing mechanism interchanging. First, there is a graph neural network applied to every uh, drug in isolation, that's the red arrows. And then after that, we update the features of every atom in one drug by considering an attention over all the atoms in the other drug, that's the blue message passing in here. And once you have these uh, layers, you can stack them together. So at every point, you take features of the two drugs and you have uh, internal message passing in each drug individually, but you also have this co-attention which allows the drugs to talk to each other during processing. And this gradually will update the features of your individual drugs nodes. And then as a resulting two features of the two drugs, you can predict whether or not they will have any uh, unexpected side effect. And uh, we compared our model just to make sure that all this machinery actually made sense. So does it make sense to have these inter-message passing steps of two drugs communicating? Does it make sense to do it like in an interchangeable way or is it okay to just do it at the end? And is it important to use multi-head attention? And uh, our results at the time put us as one of the state of of the art methods for drug-drug interaction prediction. But also at the same time, on the right-hand side, we compared all these different variants. And you can see there's actually a huge performance increase from initially just processing each drug in isolation with a graph neural network and then concatenating the results, as opposed to just having this iterative uh, first within each drug, then across drugs, then within drugs, then across drugs. That actually boosted our ROC area quite substantially. So it was around at this point when I graduated from my PhD and uh, joined DeepMind. And uh, gradually I kind of looked towards back, uh, back at classical algorithms and a bit away from biology. But what's very lucky is that uh, biology is packed with interesting classical algorithms. Like this is what first brought me to bioinformatics indeed. And uh, there are three more papers that I put out uh, in collaboration since joining DeepMind, and they represent a sort of medley of biological approaches I was involved in during this time. And two of them came really close to home. You'll see what that means in a second. And the third one, hoping, hoping I'll have enough time to cover it, was actually uh, several years uh, in the making. So the first one, the tail GNN's paper, that was a joint effort with uh, uh, Stefan, who is a currently a PhD student uh, at the University of Belgrade and uh, two profs from the University of Belgrade. So this is a collaboration with uh, folks from my hometown. And uh, it involved a very nice investigation of, uh, we wanted to look into predicting protein functions. And obviously, you know, if you want to detect mechanisms of actions for protein, it's a highly relevant task. And it's also an area where graphs crop up left, right and center. As we discussed before, you could represent the protein itself as a graph, and Gligorievich and others had a really nice paper that uh, explored this exact setting. Uh, 
Protein-protein interaction networks can be seen as graphs. If you've done any graph representation learning and you've played around with the standard PPI benchmark, that's basically protein function prediction from a protein-protein interaction network. But what one thing that's quite interesting about this domain is that a graph shows up in a fairly unexpected place. And specifically, the label space of these protein functions is itself a graph. If you've never, if you've seen it before, this is what I mean by gene ontology. And if you haven't seen it before, basically protein functions form a hierarchy where, for example, you have this master node, which just means it has a molecular function. Then there's a child node saying that it participates in binding. And then there's a lot of different types of binding it can participate to. So, and uh, our prediction task has us predicting whether a protein has any one of these nodes as its functions. And obviously there has to be some kind of completion rule. If a certain child node is uh, marked as a correct function, then all of its parents should also be tagged as correct functions. And uh, that's pretty exciting because it requires a graph neural network to be applied in the label space of the problem. So this is our labels, not nodes of the input. And we did a thorough literature survey of has anyone done this before? And we haven't actually found a graph neural network done in the label space before. And this is like, once again, if you remember, graph attention nets were propelled by our need to have uh, different graph net architectures to process brain data. Once again, a biological problem, protein function prediction motivated a core architectural advance. And we built this tail graph neural network, which uh, once again looks at the protein sequence of amino acids processes it using some labeling network. In our case, it was just a dilated convolution. And then there's a final layer which predicts a set of features for every possible label. And then we put those label features into a graph neural network layer to kind of smooth out the predictions. And then finally, we predict the final functions. So the critical part here is that you apply the graph neural network once you've assumed what your label outputs are, or at least some features for your label outputs. And this allows the graph neural network to kind of smooth out any predictions by using the edges in the gene ontology as guidance. And this actually turned out to be quite helpful if you choose the right kind of aggregation function in your graph neural network. And if you feed some extra spectral features from your gene ontology, you're actually able to substantially outperform the version which didn't have a tail gene in there. And we've been able to uh, publish this work uh, at a uh, ICML workshop last year. Um, moving on from there, I was contacted by two researchers uh, from Croatia who are currently based in Singapore. Uh, so also quite close to home. Uh, Lovro and Mila, who looked at problems in uh, neural genome assembly and how we might use uh, graph neural networks to help us there. So if you're not familiar with genome assembly, I'll give you a very quick sort of uh, introduction to what this problem actually is. So imagine you have a stack of the New York Times and uh, you plant a bunch of dynamite under it to cause an explosion. And now from this huge stack, you have to decipher what did this New York Times article actually say. It pretty much explains the problem of genome assembly. Because of the limitations of existing sequencing machines, we cannot actually read the genome all at once, but instead we can only read tiny chunks of it, which basically amounts to blowing up the New York Times and some reads burn as a result of the fire. So we don't have access to every single possible chunk of the genome. And now our job is to, from this uh, unordered soup of different DNA chunks, reconstruct the whole thing. And there are ripe algorithms in bioinformatics space that try to solve this problem as a sort of Hamiltonian path problem. And that would work, like just trying to connect two chunks if they would naturally go one after the other and try to find a path that visits all of them. But this is a bit of a problem because uh, in real life sequencing machines, errors happen. And uh, if you have an error in how you read your chunk of DNA, you'll have different artifacts in this graph. So you don't end up with a straightforward path and you have to make non-trivial decisions of, I shouldn't follow this dead end. Out of these two paths, I should choose the lower path and so on. So all of these decisions are actually crucial to how you reconstruct the final genome. And uh, what uh, Lovro and Mila set out to do alongside me was to, uh, learn a graph neural network that would algorithmically reason and learn these different heuristics uh, all together for pruning the graph. And they found that on synthetically generated graphs with errors, they were able to have a pretty good uh, generalization performance. And then they actually just dumped that pre-trained graph neural network on the graphs corresponding to the DNA of lambda phages and E. coli. And they were able to get a pretty high level of accuracy when scaling up to them. So there's a nice level of generalization from synthetic algorithmic benchmark to the real task. Uh, 
it's a still a bit of preliminary stage work, but quite encouraging for sure. Uh, and this sort of uh, boils down to some of the work I've been doing in neural algorithmic reasoning. If you'd like to know more about it and how to teach GNNs to be more algorithmic and follow algorithms, I have two uh, talks on the topic that go in way more depth. We also have a 43-page survey on graph neural networks for combinatorial optimization. Combinatorial optimization pops up a whole lot in biology, so it could very much be interesting, especially section 3.3 deals with the kind of things that uh, I've touched upon here. And finally, the project that was long in the making, uh, joint uh, work with uh, Emma and Catherine, uh, also advised by Nick Lane and Pietro, uh, was to, concerned with uh, using graph representation learning in the space of uh, clinical data, electronic health record data. So electronic health records uh, are able to provide us with plentiful information about a patient's progression, but not all the data in them are easy to leverage by deep learning systems, and we'll focus just on diagnoses for this quick exposition. There's a lot of possible diagnoses that can be attributed to a patient, and it makes it hard to distinguish patterns of comorbidity, and there's a huge tail of super rare diagnoses, so you cannot just take this diagnosis vector and feed it into a neural network. Like, it's quite difficult for deep learning models to take care of that much uh, combinatorial data. And as you can see, a super long tail of many diagnoses that almost never happen in a standard health record data set. And <laughs> coincidentally, those rare diseases are usually the most important for classifying the patient's outcome. So to set out to use this data, we asked ourselves, how do clinicians make decisions about that? diagnoses or prognoses. And taken directly from Wikipedia, we looked at this pattern recognition method where the provider of clinical uh, support uses experience to recognize a pattern of characteristics. And uh, this can be primary method used where the provider's experience may enable him to recognize the condition quickly. And we interpret this experience as I want to exploit cases that are related, so things that I've treated in the past that were quite related. And basically, a graph pops up. Now, this graph is very much real. You can create a, a bunch of nodes corresponding to different diseases and uh, link them together if they're often co-occurring, if it's a comorbidity. And it's a very rich graph that actually forms with different nice clustering structures around different uh, diseases. So it's definitely meaningful to link patients together if they have similar uh, disease uh, diagnoses. So the key assumption here is that patients with related diagnoses will likely have related prognosis. And if we use that wisely, it can be also a great way to regularize our model and make advantage of the sparse diagnosis data. We use it to draw edges in our graph. So we come up with this formula that scores two patients high if they share a lot of diagnoses, but also if the diagnoses they share are rare enough. And then we threshold that uh, to come up with the final edges of our, of our graph. And we run a graph neural network on it with some additional uh, uh, considerations that a lot of the data in the health record is uh, time series, so we use like a LSTM recurrent neural network to aggregate those uh, time series. But then we also apply a graph neural network to use the relations and also use some static embeddings of each uh, patient, such as age, uh, gender, and so on. And our results indicate that uh, by using a uh, LSTM backed by a message passing neural network, we are able to substantially uh, outperform uh, uh, just the basic LSTM on both tasks of the length of stay prediction, which are critical for hospital bed allocation, and also for the precision recall of the uh, in-hospital mortality, which is also a very important prediction task. And just very quickly, we looked at uh, how we can use the attention weight since we use the graph attention net model and it gave us um, it gave us some attention coefficients between the nodes in the graph. And we wanted to take a look at, uh, for a particular patient and its local subgraph, how, uh, how do these attention coefficients relate to actual links between the cases. And here, the thicker the arrow, the larger the attention value. So you can see that actually a node primarily concentrates to itself, but also it attaches a high attentional weight to a related male patient with a similar age group and a very similar set of uh, symptoms on admission. So it's kind of an interpretable aspect to the whole model that you can actually visualize the relatedness between cases and potentially use that to drive the final decisions. And this was also recognized at AAAI 2021 uh, as a best paper runner-up in one of the uh, health informatics workshops. <laughs> 
So in conclusion, having reached the end, studying biological problems with graph representation learning is very much likely here to stay because there's a lot of data sitting and waiting to be processed and a lot of the data given to us by nature comes in the form of a graph. And in many problems of interest, the state of the art is still a fairly shallow method in comparison. And very often, as you've seen with both uh, brain uh, data analysis that led to graph attention nets and protein function analysis, which led to tail genens, looking at a biological problem can even give you access to a core methodological progress if you're doing just core graph representation learning. And if you have the right mindset, uh, no proper biological training is really needed. What you need is the ability to carefully listen and work together with biologists and understand their problems. And uh, for the biologists in the audience, I hope I've convinced you that graph neural networks are a useful tool that are applicable basically across the board in computational biology, chemistry, and clinical science. But ultimately, I just like to use this talk as a catalyst to hopefully stimulate even more interdisciplinary research, because as I mentioned, that's where all the exciting stuff tends to happen. So without further ado, thank you so much for uh, listening. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. A huge thanks to all of my collaborators, both on the machine learning and biological side. And uh, you can also reach out offline uh, via my email or uh, any other links. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Patar. Uh, that was great. I think um, yeah, definitely need more people like yourself getting stuck into all this uh, interdisciplinary computational biology research. And uh, from my experience, we usually have a harder time convincing the computer scientists to jump into biology. So uh, that was really great. Thank you very much. Uh, we got about half an hour left uh, thereabouts to answer some questions. So I'll just start going through some of them now. Uh, but please uh, feel free to submit uh, any questions if you have any, uh, and also like questions that you like the look of, uh, so we know which ones uh, to start reading out first. Um, I'll go with this one. Uh, do you see an inherent advantage of graph attention network style attention versus transformer style attention adapted for graph networks? Or is the prevalence of GAT style attention due to the sequencing of different research that was released? Mm -hmm. So, uh, first of all, I think that there is a benefit to using uh, the graph attention net uh, attention mechanism that was originally proposed. And we actually, so when we built uh, graph attention nets, it was kind of concurrent with transformers. So we obviously tried the transformer attention mechanism at some point. And uh, it basically overfitted on all of the data sets that we tried. So basically, as a result, uh, you know, if you have low data environments and not a lot of useful signal to guide the attention, typically maybe a simpler style attention mechanism may help you compared to a transformer. And we found that actually this can be often the case in biology, right? Like very often you might deal with fairly smallish data sets. And there were indeed cases where using GAT style attention was better than transformer style attention simply from the point of view of overfitting. But, uh, you know, attention mechanism is just one movable part in the whole architecture. And having attention in there, as mentioned in the clinical trials example, is helpful because you might be able to interpret the model and also have a feel for like how are different parts of my data actually linked or how is my model seeing the links between different parts of my data. So I think there should be more research on just coming up with even like better or more novel kinds of attention that are focused on this, uh, you know, low data regime because we like we just used what was available at the time and we didn't really play around a lot with the choice of attention mechanism. But yeah, so it was definitely like uh, we tried both. We found one that worked better for the small data sets we needed to benchmark on at the time. But nowadays, I think in most cases, especially if you have a lot of data, people are tending to use transformer attention within graph attention nets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, Ruben asks, concerning the protein-protein interactions, uh, really like the approach of seeing Go as a label, as a graph, uh, as a graph of labels. Sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. Moving forward, what possible novel architectures or learning procedures uh, could be applied to such types of problems, uh, where the labels themselves are the graph? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I feel like there is a lot of potential there. And the the only real connection we've seen before to kind of neural architectures in the label space has been these attempts to combine uh, like graph neural networks with uh, conditional random fields. So a lot of the, like, the previous pushes uh, came primarily from the graphical, probabilistic graphical model community. Uh, 
which makes sense, right? Because they want to model a lot of variables that are causally related, which I mean, the gene ontology graph is one very simple example of that. So I would imagine that first of all, kind of the further avenues of developing architectures in this space should also take inspiration from probabilistic graphical models. And if you look at uh, the talk I gave on uh, graph neural net theoretical foundations, I have a, a sort of reasonably lengthy section talking about probabilistic graphical models and how they've been used to inspire GNNs. And I think the interest in these uh, areas is just starting to resurge. So I would basically advise look into PGM literature and see both what kinds of tasks are they using and how might you adapt something that they're doing to work on GNNs. And that can be like, I think one of the mo more promising avenues on uh, label space GNNs for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, someone else asks, uh, do message passing GNNs always outperform attention GNNs? Are there cases where an attention network might be preferential? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So actually, first of all, even a convolutional network might be preferential sometimes. It does have the issue of not being able to consider edge features. So if you have meaningful edge features, probably it's between those two indeed. Um, yeah, I mean, primarily, like first, just set one thing straight, message passing networks can emulate attention mechanisms. If you just decompose the message function into something that comes from the uh, sender times something that comes from the sender and the receiver, which is scalar like, so you can easily like factorize a message function to be attentional. So there's a clear representational gap in there. And uh, attention mechanisms are um, helpful in the sense that you still like limit the interaction to just one scalar, which is a bottleneck, which basically regularizes what your model is doing. So as a result, if you don't have a lot of data or you believe that's a good inductive bias that all of your interactions are just a weighted average of your neighbors or weighted combinations of your neighbors, those are the cases where I've seen attention mechanisms outperform message passing mechanisms simply because message passing mechanisms are too powerful for the task at hand or with the amount of data you have. So in terms of just expressive power, it's a no brainer that attention is a special case of message passing. So anything attention can do, message passing can do. But in terms of learnability and numbers of parameters, if your you know, learning setting is sparse enough and low data enough, attention may well be the way to go. Also, it has a benefit for interpretability, as I mentioned. So attention coefficients will give you sort of the model's internal view of how do I find relations between these two things and uh, how useful are they, right? So there's a lot of benefits, not just downstream performance that might be had from attention sometimes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, someone else asks, uh, how do you use GNNs on graph time series data? Like for instance, brain scans on fMRI time series. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a very important question. Um, to say uh, a lot of the research in graph representation learning so far has happened on static graphs. So basically, you know, you have a spatial orientation of nodes and in each node you have some features that are flat and that's it. So basically no mention of sequences. And the way in which, uh, you know, we've proceeded to do this in both the health record data and the brain mesh project is we actually completely ignore the time axis. So based on the fMRI time series, we have derived the features in every node to be just something, some flat statistics of the time series. And then we ran a graph neural network on top of that. So there was no temporal axis there. And in the case of the health records, we first ran a LSTM RNN to summarize the whole patient's progression into a flat vector of features. And then we use that, uh, you know, th then we use that to, um, to plug into a static genome. But of course, this discards a wealth of information and different time steps may correlate in funny ways. So there's a lot of exciting research going on right now to try to have more dynamic GNNs that sort of temporally adapt to the data as it comes in. And uh, in the case where you still have nice uh, per node level information arriving in every node, which will be the case for fMRI, I believe, uh, you can use these spatiotemporal graph neural networks. If you just search for that term, you will find that uh, there's a lot of papers out there because obviously it's a simpler setting, right? Basically, every node is a time series that's nicely aligned. But also, there's been a lot of exciting work recently on these temporal dynamic graph networks, primarily, for example, from Twitter, that looked at social networks where, like, at different points in time, different friendship links are formed, different nodes are coming in, different links are broken. And I mean, I believe many real world biological networks and also patient uh, data information might be coming in that particular form where things just kind of asynchronously happen and there's no real, like, uh, alignment between the time series. So 
the temporal graph networks model is kind of I think currently the state of the art in that aspect and but it's very emerging like it's basically there's been maybe two or three papers in the area so people are just starting to realize how effective they can be and yeah of course they could be a very important uh, tool for biology but yeah to answer the question that came at the beginning we never actually considered the time series when we applied the graph net we made sure the time series was flattened to just one feature vector per node yeah mm -hmm. really interesting thank you uh, ben asks, uh, have you seen applications of graph representation learning uh, on the metabolic network? Uh, I personally haven't had a chance to uh, look deeply into any papers that dealt with that. That being said, I have seen a few papers come up on my uh, scholar feed that looked into metabolic GNNs. So I can, well, I can do a Google search after this talk, but no, I haven't come across them myself, but I think I've seen a few, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, on that note, there's a few people sort of asking for links to resources that you uh, showed in the thing. So I think afterwards I'll compile a list, uh, get that from you and send it to everyone. Um, let's have a look. Most liked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the most popular question is, uh, can you share with us about your hiring ex experience uh, that you had with DeepMind? <laughs> um, so I'm nice interesting question it doesn't really you know relate that much to the um to the talk topic but uh i mean it was an interesting experience uh i had a chance to talk a lot about my research and present my work to the wider team and uh it like my work at the time especially was quite interdisciplinary so i had some experience with computational biology and gnns just some core gnn experience and uh, as a result, when I had my uh, interviews for DeepMind, I had a chance to discuss this with people with backgrounds in biology, with people with backgrounds in physics, and also with people just in backgrounds in uh, relational representation learning. So I, my, my experience was I got to chat to a lot of uh, interesting people and exciting researchers about the work that I've done from various aspects. And uh, yeah, uh, as, as a result, they found that uh, I, I, I had what was required to collaborate with them more intensely and I joined the company as a result. Um, I'm not sure if this question was asking anything else, but yeah, like from an interdisciplinary point of view, I think having an interdisciplinary career should not stop you from applying to DeepMind, like DeepMind thrives on interdisciplinary projects. Awesome, thank you. Uh, someone asks, from the talk and the literature in general, it seems that deep ML models provide improvements to most, if not all, biological problems. Does this mean that there are no inherently shallow problems in biology, or is it a side effect of only positive results being published in the literature? Mm -hmm. So I can tell you a personal perspective in that it is a bit of a side effect of only positive results being published. So for example, if somebody had previously applied a graph convolutional network on brain mesh data and got some improvements, we probably wouldn't be able to publish our graph attention network model uh, as a result there because uh, simply we improved on one of the regions, but we didn't have a consistent improvement everywhere. So not all machine learning plus biology projects end in success. Some problems are indeed inherently shallow. It depends a lot on what kind of variables you have access to, right? If you have access to the right variables, all of physics is a linear function to an extent, of course. I'm, I'm, I'm highly paraphrasing, but if you encode for the right kinds of things, you can encode forces in a linear manner, and then usually linear models will get you most of the way there. And actually, in many computational chemistry problems, you can go a long way, especially if there's low data available, you can go a long way just using chemical fingerprints as input features. And that's why, like, whenever you do a small molecule application, Application, you should always start with a fingerprint baseline to check if uh, you know all this deepness actually works. And in many cases, especially if there's low data available, you might find that the deep model just overfits to a specific part of the data and uh, doesn't work specifically. Yes. So, like I understand the talks, the talk gives a bit of a positive skew. Not everything has been successful, but actually um, there are. But you will like just talking to biologists. It, at least for me, it was always easy to find a problem that they're very deeply concerned about, like something that's very important for biologists, something that currently they're using a very shallow tool for, and something that feels like it's booming with graphs. Like whenever I had a chat with biologists, I came across one or two new interesting data sets that I could look into and try and so on. So I guess the message here is that not everything is a success, but the number of opportunities is so big that 
just randomly searching through the space would leave you with uh, some success stories for sure. At least that was the case for us. Like we didn't, uh, like we tried a lot of different things and apparently a lot of them stuck. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you. Uh, for protein-protein interaction networks, what is the next uh, big step? It seems to be an old problem, even being a standard benchmark. Uh, where do you think the next breakthrough will be? Uh, what is uh, DeepMind working on in the field now that they have uh, now that they have quote solved protein folding? <laughs> uh, it's a good question. I think there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of upcoming research. And just to kind of correct for that, if you actually read the blog post from the announcement of AlphaFold, like what we mean by solved protein folding means we're within you know experimental error on most single protein fold sequences, right? Whereas we haven't yet announced any results on what happens when you have multiple proteins interacting together and so on. Like, there's a lot of stuff left to be done. The thing which AlphaFold shows is that there is a power that you can get from harnessing large quantities of data in a scientific problem like this and get it to discover interesting heuristics, right? So I think there's going to be a lot of breakthroughs. I cannot really hypothesize what the next one is going to be because, I mean, I'm not really actively involved. Um, I'm not really actively involved in computational biology projects. I just sort of do them on the side as I go. But uh, yeah, essentially, um, I would say that incorporating information of protein-protein interaction, no matter what kind of problem you're dealing with, is very likely going to be an interesting boost. Um, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I don't have anything more specific for you, but uh, that's as far as I can tell. No, no, that was so great, thank you. Uh, someone else asks, uh, since the success of deep learning methods is often reliant on an abundance of data, are there any particular areas that you have seen that have particularly large uh, data sets available? I assume you mean biological data sets. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, well, there's been quite a few fairly large scale data sets of uh, small molecule property predictions available lately. So. That will be kind of one thing. If you look at, so if you remember at the start of my talk, I talked about these benchmarks, like uh, the open graph benchmark, uh, which has a lot of property prediction tasks uh, and graph prediction tasks, which are biologically inspired and have like millions of graphs available. So if you look into some of these like small molecule prediction tasks or protein-protein uh, interaction network tasks, they there are abundant data on a really large scale that you can use to just battle test different approaches. Now, of course, this may not be what the um, question is asking because just getting a better performance on a benchmark like this will lead you to a graph representation learning paper. It won't necessarily lead you to any biological uh, uh, novelties, but uh, it can be a great way to get familiar with the field nonetheless and give you some feel for it because all this data had to have come from a biological database. It can give you a feel for which biological databases might have the kind of data that uh, that comes in a large scale. But I would actually also like to add a comment on the point about uh, requiring large scale data. A lot of the data sets that we looked at in the papers I covered here are actually reasonably small scale in comparison. So for example, for the antibody residue prediction task, we only really looked at the antibody antigen complexes that were readily available in the Oxford SABDAB database. And I think the number of antibody antigen pairs available there in PDB format was, was actually not that big. So I think we're looking at hundreds, maybe thousands of uh, samples, which obviously in deep learning terms might be tiny. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, one very light question is, Frank, I'm not sure if you have time to go into the details, but practically speaking, how is a message passing function where m equals psi uh, xi xj different from an intention function where a equals xi xj? So, key difference, very quick difference, is that the psi function returns a vector and the a function returns a scalar. So basically in attention, you're still doing a combination of all the psi of neighbors, but the interaction coefficient is computed as a scalar. Whereas in the message function, the two interacting nodes collaborate to compute an entire vector. So that's that's the main difference basically. And that also explains why attention is more interpretable because if you have only one scalar computed along every edge, uh, which scales the neighbor's vector, then you can interpret that by saying, okay, this is how much this neighbor is important to me, or this is how much I value the link between these two things. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, someone asks, have graph neural networks been applied to RNA secondary structure prediction? Uh, very good question. Uh, actually, I'll do a very quick, uh, I know I shouldn't do that because I'm sharing my screen, but uh, afterwards I'll do a very quick lookup. I'm quite sure that Will Hamilton was involved in a collaboration that involved some aspect of RNA structure prediction. So actually, if you just Google for uh, Will Hamilton, uh, his scholar profile, I think one of his most recent papers involved RNA and used genomes. So I would take a look at that. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, someone asked, can you use uh, GeneNs to do dimensionality reduction? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, definitely so. I mean, in terms of dimensionality reduction, if you look at something like an autoencoder, that's like the first thing I would think of for dimensionality reduction is like, you know, you start from an input which is featureized in some way, you compress it to some smaller bottleneck embedding, and then you force that bottleneck embedding to be predictive of something, either reconstructing the original inputs or something like that. So from that point of view, if you just want to like have a lower dimensional representation in every node, you could teach a variational autoencoder, for example, to uh, process your input graph, get you smaller node features, and then from those smaller node features, have another GNN that reconstructs the original graph in as accurately as possible. You can also do whole graph information. There's been a lot of exciting ones in chemistry. Uh, so the junction tree variational autoencoder is one I can think of uh, off the top of my head, where you start from a molecular representation, then have a tree representation as a result, and then compress that whole tree into a flat embedding for the entire graph. And then from that flat embedding of the entire graph, reconstruct the molecule. So and, uh, first the tree, then the molecule. So this is very helpful, not just for dimensionality reduction, like this will give you nice embeddings for a molecular data set, but also can be useful for generative applications, which I didn't touch upon here at all, because I think we still have a long way to go before having super successful generative models uh, in biology. But uh, just to note, this can be useful for sampling completely new vectors and then sampling novel molecules from them, which can be a potential future uh, prospect for drug discovery. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, I think this might be similar to the question we had earlier, but uh, would you like to comment on continuous versus discrete representations of graphs in the latent space? Uh, uh, interesting. So the, pro the problem is that there are multiple ways I could interpret that question because uh, does this mean discrete or continuous features in the nodes or do I treat edges as discrete links or continuous, uh, you know, uh, edge weights? You know, these things are not that clear, but I'll try to answer both of these angles and hopefully one of them is what the what the question, what the, what the person was asking. So, um, so in terms of uh, using discrete features in the nodes, uh, there are definitely, or edges, there are definitely some papers that try to exploit that. Uh, and actually in computational physics, it uh, has seen some application where, for example, imagine you have a set of particles and you have to figure out uh, how they're interacting so that you can then predict how they're going to move in the future. And the interaction types you assume up front that there are maybe k different types of interaction, right? So something like, uh, you know, like uh, charges, uh, gravity, these different types of interactions, right? And you can, or particles could be literally tied together by a spring or something. And uh, in this case, uh, you could actually teach a graph neural network to predict discrete features in every edge saying what's the type of interaction and then use those discrete features to further on predict what the next positions will be for every node. So that's one case, the neural relational inference paper from Thomas Kiff and Ethan Fataya, which um, basically, um, uh, which uh, does that with great success and actually predicts nicely the, the rollouts of physical systems. So there's definitely a case for using discrete stuff as intermediate features. In terms of uh, graphs, like uh, edges themselves, like do we just have a fixed set of edges or do we have a more soft way of uh, different edges being differently important? I think transformers are a pretty strong evidence that it's a good idea to sometimes consider complete graphs and just let the network learn how much it values every edge uh, in a continuous way. 
So there's definitely a benefit to doing that. The downside of this is that there's an obvious quadratic complexity uh, happening as a result. So basically, if you have, if you want to allow your model to have all pairs of nodes interacting in different ways continuously, then you need to store n squared different attention coefficients or even worse, n squared different messages. And this quickly becomes uh, cumbersome as you increase the number of nodes. So actually what I'm quite excited about in this space is something that works on the middle ground. So it predicts some edge level pairwise interactions, but then uses them to only sample a small subset of edges that it's actually going to use for message passing in this step. And if you're interested in more approaches, these have definitely seen some applications in the bio domain. Uh, you could check out the differentiable graph module paper from uh, Michael Bronstein's group, uh, which uh, like on some patient graphs figures out at every step of message passing, what's the connectivity I should use and then uses that to have better um, predictions. So basically uh, a very quick TLDR to how I understood this question is they're both likely very useful in different cases and they have their pros and cons. You just need to be careful about what your problem is and how you're best setting up your approach for the problem at hand. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We're getting towards the end of our time, so I'll just do a couple more questions. Uh, do you see a possible intersection point uh, between GNNs and reinforcement learning? Very much so. Uh, I'm actually personally involved in a few of those. So I think reinforcement learning is uh, one of the most uh, exciting developments in machine learning more generally like not just within biology, also within biology, there's been some really exciting developments at the intersection of these two, especially when it comes to molecule generation. But uh, just generally speaking, I feel like a lot of aspects of the RL pipeline uh, have graphs in them. So the, you know, the, the state transition diagram itself is a graph, then different states can be represented as graphs, especially if you're solving maze-like problems. And uh, also uh, your agent itself may be represented as a graph if you're controlling a body or something like that. So there's a lot of interesting ways in which you can plug graphs into RL and a lot of them are being explored right now. If you want to read more about what I've done personally within RL, you should check out our uh, Excelvin paper, which uh, recently came out on the archive, which uh, plugs GNNs into implicit planners. I've also given a few talks on the topic. Uh, there was one at UCL a few weeks ago, which is publicly available on YouTube. So. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I think we'll make this our last question, which is a uh, good biology one. After predicting the key residues in protein functions, uh, can GNNs be used uh, for protein engineering to alter function? Very good question. And, uh, you know, this is kind of the order in which we were originally thinking when we set out to do our first Pareto prediction paper. Like, before you get good at generation, you need to get good at prediction. So figure out what's the underlying mechanism, then hopefully tweak it to get it to do what you want. So uh, I can give you a hopeful question, uh, answer to that question, which is yes, I believe it should be possible, but I don't think there's been any GNN paper doing something like this because I feel like we still need a few steps before we can actually have a solution like that. But you know, on that note, definitely watch this space. I feel like uh, that's the way to go. Yeah. Uh, well, Pata, um, all that's left to say is thank you very much uh, for the great talk. Um, it's always great to see when, uh, you know, something as uh, technical as this, both from the computer science and the biology side, is uh, so well communicated uh, to both camps. So, um, you know, we're really grateful. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. And uh, if you have any thoughts, feedback or anything like that, feel free to reach out to me via email. I'm uh, very happy to chat further. Thank you for the really nice questions. And thanks again, Charlie, for having me. Not at all. That's a pleasure. Uh, I think we'll end the talk there.